Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Barometer Readings Monthly Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session, at which time instructions will be provided. For operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Sarah Potosky. Please go ahead, Ms. Potosky. Hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us this call, which allows us to communicate our views with you and highlight recent portfolio changes. On the call today, David Burroughs will provide a global macro update, speak to how we navigated the portfolios during the recent correction, and outline where our breadth models currently stand. We feel these corrections often present long-term buying opportunities as companies have sold off within the market. Also joining us on the call is Jimmy Brennan, Head of Fixed Income Trading, and Paul Campbell, Head of Research, which are going to speak specifically about the balance mandate and provide some color on individual securities that meet our leadership themes, including fixed income. With that, I will turn it over to Dave. Hey, folks. <clears throat> Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, obviously, a timely uh, moment to have a conversation. It's been an interesting week. It's amazing what a couple of days means in this market. Um, what I want to do just quickly is, is go back to some basic principles uh, and then talk through what's been going on market-wise and what we've been doing in the portfolio. You know, we talk about having three basic things that we have to accomplish for us all to keep our clients. One is to try and take advantage of strength in the market and, and leadership takes a lot of different forms. It's been pretty consistent over the last year. <clears throat> um, but we, we really have to get targeted in those areas. You don't have to be everywhere. The second thing we have to do is watch for change. And, and that's a relevant topic in the market that we're in right now, uh, signs for any leadership change, and be prepared to make changes as markets go through those uh, transitions. And then the third thing is in the absence of leadership, how do we play some defense uh, and, uh, and not give returns back? So um, in the model that we use, as you know, we spend a lot of time with our top-down model trying to understand where money is getting put to work, where money is leaving, where we can find expanding breadth or where the percentage of stocks performing well is expanding, and, and where we see deterioration, you know, be prepared to play some defense. If you think about the life cycle of how a, a, a market cycle works or a, a cycle in a sector, you know, when you head, head into a decline, the very weakest securities tend to decline first, and as selling picks up steam, it impacts more and more securities. Confidence is lost until late in the decline, you get to the point where people will sell what they can sell, and even the leaders often get hurt. Now, conversely, when strength comes back to the market, you should see buying in the stocks that have held up the best first, and then it spreads through the rest of the market. If you think about what's happened over the last year, you know, we are always watching for, for transition, and you know that we have had the view <clears throat> that as of uh, 2012, we entered a new long-term bull market for stocks. And when we look at the last bull market in the 80s and 90s, there's a few things that characterized that bull market. One was you had earnings growth. Two, you had a, a rising multiple in the market, so the multiple for the average stock went from seven times earnings in 82 to 30 times earnings in 1999. Three, you had falling correlations, meaning there were certain sectors that really benefited from the key macro shift, which of course was technology at that point, and certain sectors that were hurt by it. And so through that bull market, correlations fell. Leadership became very clear, and laggards became very clear. And the fourth thing is when the trouble came, they were short, sharp corrections that were marked by profit taking. They always raised fear. They weren't insignificant, but they were over quickly and the market drove on. Leadership reemerged and the buyers came back quickly. And that's how people went from being underinvested in stocks in 1982 to overinvested in stocks by 1999, because every time the market pulled back, people jumped in and added to their holdings. So 
You know that we have a view that we entered a new bull market in 2012. Our view has been that this bull market is being driven by <clears throat> plentiful energy and, you know, a revolution in the way that uh, energy was produced, uh, first in the U.S. and Canada and, and now pushing out around the world, <clears throat> that the U.S. Uh, has really been independent. And in the first two years of that bull market, the leadership was the producers and the service companies and the infrastructure companies that moved the stuff around because you had big boom in volume and you had pricing. You had more demand than supply. And then last summer, of course, in July, that breadth model that we used showed that we went from close to 70% of energy stocks performing well. The percentage of stocks doing well started to fall. So breadth started to narrow and that forced us to say, something is changing, leadership is changing, we've got to reduce our weighting in energy and through the use of stops and, and paring back our positions over the course of the next few months, the energy position had to leave the portfolio. Now, at that point, there's a couple of things you can do. The first, first uh, emotional response for most investors is to say, boy, that was a great space to be invested in for three years. Now they're cheap. Maybe we should go buy them. And that's what a lot of the hedge community in 2015, they went and bought energy for what they thought might be a bounce back to $100 a barrel. The other thing you could do is you could watch these breadth models and say, where's the money going? And through the fall of last year, it was very clear that the pickup in breadth was in sectors and geographies that benefited from a low price stack in energy. And so the U.S. market led. And within the U.S. market, there was some very clear leadership, consumer being the first. And we know that the consumer really drives over 70% of the U.S. economy. You got low interest rates and you had low, lower fuel prices. And the consumer discretionary sector really took off in August and September last year and really hasn't looked back since. Now, I've got a, a set of charts here in my, in my computer that, as you guys know, I work through in presentations. And in the course of the last couple of days, I've been putting them up in front of people. These are charts that were as of the middle of last week. And as of the middle of last week, consumer discretionary sector as a whole had very clear leadership, no break in trend. If you just went below the surface, retail, including all the worst bricks and mortar companies, very clear leadership. Internet retail, the secular growth within retail, which would include Amazon, was trading right at the highs. Leisure and travel had basically been trading sideways for three months, no sign of damage. Home builders hit new highs last week in the middle of the week. So the, the consumer sector clearly and um, logically a beneficiary of low energy prices. The second sector that wins within the domestic economy in the U.S. is healthcare, and that not only has a strong backdrop from an improving economy, uh, more money to spend due to Obamacare and uh, good demographics. Within healthcare, there's pharma, there's biotech, you've got healthcare devices, you've got healthcare providers. All of these groups have been very, very consistent, and again, up to last week, very strong. Technology. Corporations have lots of cash. There doesn't appear to be tremendous demand and need to build a lot of new capacity, but they're all certainly looking for productivity. And so lots of areas of technology over the last year have been leading the market, including software and specifically internet security software, um, but many areas in that camp. And then the, the fourth group, which again, quite domestically focused, uh, and dependent on a slowly improving economy in U.S. financials. After trading sideways for a year, it broken out earlier in the summer to new highs. And that included the big banks, it included the regional banks, and included insurance companies. So, so these groups, going back to the life cycle of a market, when you start to have deterioration, it starts with the weaklings, and at the very end, it's going to come back and hit the leaders. Now, what has been having slow, dripping declines over the course of this year? The have-nots. You've had high-yield debt as being weak in certain areas, specifically because of energy having an impact on the indices themselves. Utilities, 
energy producers and service companies. And if you look at all of these charts, steady dripping declines marked by the odd short sharp upward correction or short covering rally. Gold, commodity markets as a whole hitting new lows all the way through the year. So you know that we've had a view that asset classes are constantly being revalued and the equity asset class, especially consumer-led developed markets, have been seeing multiple expansion for the last three years. We've seen falling correlations. We've seen very short corrections. On the other hand, in commodities, you had 12 years of revaluation between 2000 and 2012 to the upside, and now three years of steady dripping declines. That flows through into emerging markets, which have been weak across the board steadily for the last two years. So we've been in a have and have not market. Even in the S&P, there were a number of groups that had good, strong green responses so far this year and a group of sectors that have had quite negative experiences this year. When you look around the world, the other developed consumer-led markets like Japan and India have been good performers early, early through this year as well. So let's look at the breadth models as they are. If you look at breadth for equities globally, you saw deterioration in breadth start in April of this year and weaken from April all the way through to the current place we sit today. Now, on the, on the global breadth model, let's just see if I can pull it up here, uh, we fell from 60% to the current level at 26%. So 26% of stocks globally have held up in price. So for those of you who have seen our presentation over time, we talk about the fact that when breadth gets below 30%, we're getting to low levels. To put it in perspective, breadth is sitting at the same level today. It sat at in the bottom of the correction in 2011 and at the same level it got to in 2008. If you take the Canadian stock market, it's the same picture. We got to the same level we got to in 2011's correction and the same level we got to in 2008's correction. If you take a look at the U.S. breadth model, the breadth in the U.S. held on longer than any other market world but started to see some weakness at the, end of at the end of June. Very targeted in have-not sectors. Didn't wash through until the leadership sectors until Tuesday, Wednesday of last week. So, last week obviously uh, was a tough week, Thursday, Friday, and Monday. In the S&P, if we looked at the S&P index chart, it broke down out of a wedge uh, technical pattern on Wednesday, which to me is the highest high likelihood of success price pattern that I've seen in my career. And in the pooled accounts that we run on Thursday, we hedged up close to 100% of our exposure. So while the leadership sectors hadn't really broken down, we did put very significant hedges on in the portfolios. And that really helped us on Friday and Monday when the market opened down 1,000 points. Now let's talk about what things look like on Monday. We have four short-term indicators that we use. Percent of stocks that trade above the 50-day moving average, the percent of stocks that trade above the 150-day moving average, percent of stocks trading, um, hitting new highs versus new lows, and the percentage of stocks with positive price momentum. All four of those indicators in each of the markets that we follow got to absolute rock bottom levels. So uh, when I went to do BNN yesterday morning, um, one of the questions was, what are you looking for for a reversal? We said we need to see a solid up day of greater than 2% with greater than uh, 8 to 1 positive negative uh, advance. And then we need to see a follow through day within the next week where you got another 1.5 to 2% on strong breadth which is exactly what we've had in the last two days. Um, so given where short-term indicators were and given the response yesterday, we removed the hedges on the portfolios. Um, and as of today, uh, it looks as though both the short 
and some of the long-term indicators will have reversed up in the positive territory. Now, does that mean that we can't retest the lows? Absolutely not. It could, we could retest lows. Um, but I think that there's a good evidence that this is what, what we've talked about, a short, sharp correction in a bull market. You had a move in the S&P of about 12% from top to bottom. It's the biggest correction we've seen in about four years. Um, it looks to me from a technical perspective as though uh, we've had some capitulation in the strong stocks. Uh, and when we look at where the market rallied in the last couple of days, leadership groups have been quite strong. So if we had had this conversation yesterday, what I'd tell you uh, going into yesterday is that in the portfolios, the sector weightings haven't been terribly different than they have been for the last three weeks other than having a small amount of cash. Uh, the, the, the income portfolio biggest weight is financials at about 35%, US-based financials primarily, uh, technology about 12%, healthcare about 10%, consumer discretionary about 10%. Um, there was uh, um, geographic exposure about 70% in the U.S., about 27% in Canada. The Canadian holdings, typically holding, holdings that benefit with a weak Canadian dollar. Um, with the hedges, we had small exposure. As we close today, we would be over 90% uh, invested. Uh, if you take a look at the equity portfolio, uh, the equity portfolio biggest weight would be 25% consumer discretionary, 23% technology, 16% financials, 15% healthcare, essentially fully invested as of this afternoon uh, in an absence of hedges. I'm going to let Jimmy and Paul talk about the balance pool, um, but when we look at it, when we look at returns, uh, in the period between August the 18th and August the 25th, the S&P was down 11%. The MSCI World Index was down 9.8. The S&P TSX was down 7.5. The equity pool was down 4.4% in that same period. The income pool was down 3.3. Uh, global macro was down 2%. Um, the portfolios have held in really well. So I think that we came into this period uh, well ahead of our benchmarks in all of the mandates other than the income portfolio. Um, we've maintained and I think gained on that lead going through the sloppiness over the last week. Um, and uh, I think we're positioned well coming out the other side. The trick in a bull market is when the buying comes back to have the opportunity to take advantage of it and not be left sitting with too much cash. Um, now on the income portfolio, in May, we sorry April, we had the conversation about the fact that we had been leading, or sorry, lagging our peers and lagging the benchmark for two key reasons. The first was because we had chosen not to focus in energy, and the energy sector had a bounce in the early part of the year that we missed. We also had not been focused in the interest rate proxies or the bond proxies. Our view was that we were positioning for what was coming, which was slightly more economically sensitive. So we published a slide that showed the seven periods where for a period of months we underperformed our benchmark and what happened one year out, two years out, and three years out, and in each case we were well ahead of the benchmark. The average was 6% ahead one year out, 11% out ahead two years out, and 21% three years out. Since that time, since April the 14th, uh, the income portfolio has gained a little over 7% versus the benchmark. Uh, one, by not giving it up with energy, and two, by not having the same level of volatility going through the last week. So I think that we're in good shape across all of the mandates. Um, I know it can be frustrating sometimes. Our correlations aren't exactly in line with the market, um, but our goal is always to be in a position to take advantage of things when things get a little better. We think probably the fall uh, and late in the year is going to be a fruitful time to be invested. If you go back to the 1990s, it was only about four occasions where you got greater than 10% corrections. Um, and when they came, if you're able to skate through them, you were in good position on the other side. And uh, so we'll see what the next couple of weeks brings. Um, it's possible we've got 
uh, two or three weeks of weakness, although I am very encouraged by the fact that we have a big up day and then a big follow-up day right in behind uh, and that leadership participated uh, nicely. So what I want to do is pass it over to Paul and Jimmy and give them an opportunity to talk a little bit about the balance pool. It's been an island of stability uh, over the last number of months and uh, let them talk about a few of the positions. Thank Great. you, David. Go ahead, Paul. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so just as a reminder on the balance pool and the balance fund, uh, Jim and I are co-managers. Uh, the approach is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we focus on securities where we see the opportunity for substantial growth and gains through capital appreciation and or income. So there isn't any minimum income requirement. We don't, uh, we don't avoid dividends, but uh, we have a total return focus. Um, the key constraint we have uh, is a minimum 25% exposure to fixed income and that's a very flexible uh, constraint. Uh, we can achieve that through uh, straight bonds, converts, uh, preferred, so on. Um, we take a balanced portfolio construction approach, integrating the equity and the fixed income. Um, I think that's quite different. Uh, and we obviously utilize uh, barometers, disciplined leadership uh, approach and uh, top-down uh, top models, which leads us to the same sectors and themes uh, in the balanced portfolio as the others. At the end of the day, it's a medium-low risk um, and uh, medium-low uh, volatility um, portfolio that, uh, that we're looking for. So, uh, you know, we're definitely not an asset allocation play. We don't just uh, take a fixed income portfolio and an equity portfolio, weld them together. We very actively manage that mix. Uh, and also the uh, evaluation of a company's uh, entire capital structure to choose uh, debt and equity securities makes it somewhat different as well. Um, in terms of our current positioning, uh, over the last few weeks we uh, sold a few positions, uh, as we were stopped out, uh, raised some cash on a net basis. Uh, we also redeployed some cash, uh, recently uh, purchasing Google and uh, some bond positions um, that Jim will talk about. Uh, so currently uh, in the pool, we're roughly 5% cash. Uh, in the fund, roughly 9% cash. Uh, bond weightings, uh, we were... Uh, down in the uh, 27% area, we raised that somewhat uh, to the 37% area. Uh, equity weighting is down slightly from uh, low 60s into the high 50s. Uh, equity hedges, as Dave mentioned, we, uh, we put them on a week or so ago and uh, we've been uh, reducing those back. We're currently 20% hedged on our equity positions and on the foreign currency, the US dollar positions, roughly 25% hedged. Um, so, uh, so we're not uh, definitely not standing still. Um, the portfolio has held up well through the volatility, giving back some of the gains, but uh, still uh, still ahead for the year. And uh, you know, watching uh, closely the markets, uh, looking for opportunities uh, to put some of the uh, cash to work as well. And Jim, if you want to speak a bit about sure, sure. Um, I know David mentioned over the uh, period of the last couple of weeks what the uh, major indices were down, S&P and TSX. Um, I think we were down about two and a quarter percent over that, over that time period. So held in pretty well. Um, insofar as I want to talk a little bit about fixed income, um, and insofar as we need to hold fixed income, we try to eliminate as many variables um, that would add to volatility or diminish an optimal outcome. And so if we can find securities uh, debt that has covenants or traits that make them somewhat immune to market volatility or the actions of Canadian or American or European central banks, um, then I think it's a good place to start. And, you know, you could almost call this stuff yield to call paper, um, where the issuer in two instances briefly is going to be strongly compelled to call the paper at their first possible option because it would be economically punitive for them to let the paper exist after this first call date. Um, in this environment, the yield to call paper currently is running around 2%. Uh, so you could consider that somewhat of a risk-free rate 
uh, although it's been coming down as expectations in uh, Canada for higher rates have been diminished. But we've identified uh, Credit Agricole piece of paper that was uh, issued in 2009 as a five and a half coupon uh, fixed floater, so fixed rate coupon that converts to floating in August of 16. Um, and it was issued as tier one capital when things got tough, as all of us probably remember. And uh, in 2016, it becomes a floating rate piece of paper, no longer becomes a Basel III tier one capital stock and it uh, becomes a drag on their balance sheet. They've already redeemed $341 million of a $400 million issue, so the odds of them retiring the last $59 million are pretty high. Um, and so we'll clip, uh, we'll clip five and three-quarter percent from now till then. Uh, the bank has been really scrubbed clean. It's gone, undergone extensive costs and risk reduction. Their credit quality improvements are way up, and uh, they have no dis direct exposure to Greece, and they have a very strong balance sheet. So we think that's a good place to be in terms of uh, shelter from the storm. Another piece of paper I'll, I'll mention is the uh, uh, Great Canadian Gaming. They, are, uh, they run racetracks and uh, casinos, which is uh, pretty strong cash flow generators. Margins run well above 40%. They only have one debenture. It's a $450 million issue, six and five-eighths coupon, mature, matures in 2022. And uh, there's a covenant in this $450 million issue that requires 50% of all net income to go into cash basket. And that cash is now over $400 million today. So the issuer is constrained as to what they can do with the cash, and so the bond is effectively defeased in that sense. Uh, the operator approached all the bondholders in May, asking, um, pr offering a cash incentive to waive this covenant, uh, so they could take that 400 million and buy back stock. Uh, the bondholders declined, um, and uh, from now till May of 17, there's nothing they can do. In May of 17, they can call the bonds at 103.31, and again, that'll give us a 5.75 percent return from now till May of 17. And I think that works for us. The company's under levered. And again, with yield to call paper at 2%, 575 mm. seems like an outsized return. So those are a couple examples of the things we're trying to do uh, to minimize. Paul, do you want to talk about a couple of the latest additions? Uh, sure. I mentioned uh, in the technology area theme throughout the portfolios, uh, we've added Google. Uh, there's a bunch of attractive attributes. It's very, obviously, strong balance sheet, uh, very profitable, strong cash uh, generator. They announced reorganization of the company that will separate, essentially, the profitable search advertising component from the other more venture-oriented uh, investments, which are not generating earnings. That should highlight added value within the company. The stock responded very positively to that. We see, uh, we see more to come. Uh, it's a very unique business. There's not really anything else quite like Google. Um, everybody, many companies are threatened by it, but no one's uh, really able to, uh, to duplicate what they've got. Uh, so very attractive business in the technology area. We also have electronic arts in the uh, software technology uh, consumer area. Uh, related to technology and financial services, we have uh, Fiserv and DH Corp benefiting from all the changes going on in banking, the outsourcing of services, the need for banks to rationalize and cut costs. Uh, very strong positions. Uh, both of them are major players in a very large market with still relatively small market shares and uh, terrific opportunity to grow over a long period of time. Uh, in the financials, uh, we don't have any Canadian banks currently. Uh, we have good representation in uh, the U.S. financials. Uh, we have Wells Fargo on the banking side, uh, AIG on the insurance side, and in Canada we have Fairfax Financial on the insurance side as well. Um, on the uh, consumer side, uh, tied to home building, uh, we also have uh, Newell Rubbermaid, a very well-run business with significant cost-cutting opportunities, continuing to do very well. Uh, again, the stock has held up extremely well, continues to perform very well. And uh, so we'll be uh, looking for more uh, opportunities in some of the areas that, uh, that we've highlighted and discussed. Uh, 
So that's uh, great. Thanks, thanks, Paul. So, so just <clears throat> just to kind of wrap some of the comments here, um, our, I think our job is to make sure we follow our process. Our job is to make sure that uh, we play some defense when things get difficult. Uh, to stay focused in the groups that do show leadership, that have that have good fundamental backdrop. I think one of the concerns over the last few weeks has been very weak energy prices and the devaluation in the yuan was pointed to the fact that there was a lack of demand in the in the economy. And very specifically, you know, we are focused in the US economy. And when you look at the economic data that's coming out of the US, the economic surprise indicator has been moving higher. Uh, consumer confidence came in well higher than expectation. Employment growth has been better than expected. That GDP number today at a revision to plus 3.7%, well above expectation, does not point to a weakening economy. So the <coughs> sectors that benefit from that are the sectors that we're focused in. Um, one question that we had, and I just want to address, is that what happens to our stop losses on a day when the market opens down a thousand points? And one of the obvious questions you might ask is if we had two terrible days like Friday and Monday in the market, how is it that we can be coming out of that you know, fairly fully invested? So first of all, we had hedges in the portfolios. So that mitigate, mitigated our risk. But there's one thing that many of you heard me say, heard me say in presentations along the way, and, and that is that when you use stop, or when we use stop losses, there's only one thing that's going to cause us not to execute on a stop, and that is in the absence of a bid. We are never going to push a position over the edge of a cliff when there's no buyer on the other side. So as you know, in our, with our stops, we have price, prices uh, as targets. If uh, there's a break in liquidity and an effect, we saw dislocation in the market on Friday and Monday. Uh, we are not going to push positions into a no-bid market when we know they are fundamentally sound to begin with. And we do follow our stops pretty religiously, um, but that's the one period of time when we're not going to do that. So in the separately managed accounts we run, same thing uh, on the uh, uh, wrap platforms. You know, there weren't a lot of stops hit because, frankly, we weren't going to push uh, positions off into the abyss. And here we are a couple of days later. We knew that the short-term indicators were extremely oversold. Uh, here we are two days later. We're facing a very different market picture. So I think that uh, we're in a pretty good spot. So, um, look, we don't get many 10% corrections in the type of market that we're in. I think this is presenting a really good opportunity. I'm really excited the way the uh, portfolios are positioned. I'm excited the way they responded in the last couple of days. Um, so uh, as we head toward the fall, I think we're going to see money continue to rotate back towards equities. So before we take any questions, I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to attend the monthly conference call. Again, we feel this correction presents long-term buying opportunities for your clients and our clients. If you would like specific information on our mandates or any client-friendly pieces, please reach out to Nick Hamilton, Kayla Peacock, or myself. And with that, we'll open up the floor to any questions you may have.